Hello and welcome to Ranking 76, where we are ranking 76 heroes and villains of the American West. I'm Eric. And I'm Matt. And today we're on person two of three as we head on to Little Bighorn, where today we're talking Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse. (laughs) I don't even know him. Yeah. Sounds a little uh, crazy, though. You know, we're going to find out it's kind of an ironic nickname because he's he's a very somber, somber guy. So uh, we just got done talking about Custer. Uh, I think we're still kind of recovering from both of his episodes. Crazy Horse, uh, and you'll even see with Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, there's not as many sources as there are with Custer. There's still plenty to talk about, but... There's definitely not anywhere near as much as there was for Custer, which I think at the end may hurt them a little bit, but uh, it just because there's going to be a lot of times where we're going to be skipping a fair amount of their lives uh, because there's just not anything really interesting to talk about other than, yeah, they're a really big deal, but it's really hard to explain how big of a deal they are. Is it also like they don't keep it's not like they keep like massive amounts of records either right it's oral history so a lot of especially with crazy with crazy horse uh, a lot more is written about sitting bull um and you're gonna see in his episode next episode that he is once he starts getting onto the on the reservation there's a lot more sourcing on him because the americans are writing a lot more things down on him crazy and near proximity of him too right near proximity and he's a celebrity but we'll get into that crazy horse doesn't ever really do that and in fact he doesn't really ever get his picture taken there's one picture that people claim is him but it's never been verified uh so i I, you really don't even know what he looks like the picture i'm going to use for his uh his graphic on this episode is a sketch made by someone in like the 1930s and then they showed that to crazy horse's sister and she was like yeah that kind of looks like him so like he'd be Picture whoever yeah, you maybe. want in your head. Just yeah, this might bit. be him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that really is it. So there's, there's a lot. Are we ready? Let's do this. Crazy Horse is born in the year uh, where a hundred horses were taken. So the Lakota don't actually use numbers like we do. They pick an event, and that's what they tend to use. Uh, to name the year. So in this particular year, the Lakota raided a hundred horses without losing a single man or horse. So they decided to name the year of a hundred horses were taken. How literal. I remember that that year. Such a good year. Such a good year. Care to guess what that year was? Do you remember? Yeah, go ahead. Mm, 1832. (laughs) You're not far off. It's 1840. Or 1845. Oh, close, close. Within 15 years. Yep, you sure did. You also could probably redo the math from uh, Little Big Horny. He can't be that old, but yes. His name, I am going to, I'm only going to try to pronounce this once and I'm going to butcher it because I do not speak Lakota, but I believe it is pronounced Tunske Witko. Tunske Witko. Yes. Uh, Sorry for butchering that. It can be translated to his crazy horse or his horse is crazy. However, we need to pump the brakes on that because that's not his name yet. It's his dad's name. It's actually an inherited name. His grandfather had it. His father had it. He's eventually going to have it. What we are going to call him is by his nickname, because apparently as a young boy or and as he grew up into manhood, he was slender with wavy brown hair. And because of that, they nicknamed him Gigi, or Light Hair. Again, Mm. fairly literal. Right. Very literal. (laughs) Yes, there's there's no messing around with him. He was born into the Oglala band of the Lakota, and his father is a holy man. He was slender, again, with that wavy brown hair. His complexion was also not as dark as other Lakotas. His eyes were dark. And he had a narrow face with long, straight Lakota nose and a wide mouth. 
He might not have been thrilled with his nickname, however, because light hair, brown hair, was often attributed to Lakota girls rather than the men. Okay, okay. Nothing wrong with that. No, there isn't, but I'm sure there was going through whatever the equivalent of Lakota Middle School was. I'm sure there was a little bit of picking on. His mother dies early on in his childhood, potentially either could have been through suicide, likely either falling out of favor with her husband, again, whose name is Crazy Horse, or she might not have been able to conceive children, which might have led to the suicide. Do they so like when my, when they can't have children, are they like ostracized and like kicked out of the tribe? Depending on the tribe, but it just sounded like it, it kind of that's what made me. What or do they me feel me like or do they feel like as like the like the woman herself, does she feel like she's useless? So nothing for her. Both. Okay. I mean, you can read into that if if she's unable to conceive a child, I'm sure there's also social pressures that are, that would lead her to commit suicide. If that's indeed what has happened. Right. Uh, so other, the men didn't actually, for the Lakota, the men didn't actually help raise the children until they became teenagers, like when they're ready to start fighting. So he would actually be passed around from his grandmother or just other Lakota women would help raise him uh, until he's about 10, 10 years old. When he is 10, he would have been given an age-appropriate bow and started his training as a warrior. And part of this training, we talked a little bit about it in Red Cloud's episode, which is still unbelievable to me. But part of their target practice is that they would shoot grasshoppers out of the air with an arrow. Which is incredible. Do not even let me try that. Do not even let me try that. I'd be I'd be a pull a tenskatawa and get my eye knocked out. The arrow shoots backwards? Yes. <laughs> Wait, no, no. The the sharp point is is supposed to go away from you, not towards oh. you. Oh, <laughs> did you ever watch Almost Heroes? The bad Chris Farley. Oh, of course. The bad. It's hilarious. It's very. I don't know if it holds up. I don't know if it holds. I up. thought it was hilarious too. I bought it. I watched it. I still like it, but it's not that funny. It doesn't really hold up. Oh man, that's too bad. That was when like. I think Friends was still going because Matthew Perry was. He was. It. Yes. And like Eugene Levy and like, I I do like the movie. It's just, it's not as good as you remember, but I do love Chris Farley. Rip. R.I.P. Yes. Elders would then take him out on hunts and they would give him kind of. It's good advice, but it seems a lot to give to a 10-year-old. An elder would tell him, quote, A family of a good hunter is well-fed. They wear fine clothes because he can take the deer and the elk so the women can can tan the hides and sew them into shirts and dresses and moccasins. The family of a poor hunter is thin, has worn clothes because there are no new hides to sell, What do you want everybody to say about how you provide for your family? And all I can think is, I'm 10 years old. Why are you this putting this much pressure on me? Chill, 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 chill. Just take a step down. It's fine. I will get there. Another lesson while hunting Light hair would be given a bow to go chase for a rabbit, except for on one occasion, an elder actually takes his bow away from him just as he is about to pull, pull the bow and shoot the rabbit because he wants light hair to go chase after it. And after two or three steps, it becomes really clear that light hair isn't actually going to be able to catch the rabbit and it runs away. The teacher wanted to use this moment to tell light hair that you basically can't catch a hair. You're a human. You need to be able to adapt, even though this isn't your strength saying, quote, remember that we all have weaknesses and strengths. Sometimes the hair will win. And sometimes you, even the wolf fails more than he wins, but he doesn't stop. He has great fangs. He can smell the trail two days old and he can hear over the next hill, but his real strength is endurance. He never quits. Meanwhile, light hair was probably like, you could have just told me that. 
and allowed me to shoot the hair. But thank you for this very dramatic experiment. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm so glad this had to be demonstrated by making me look like an idiot trying to chase a rabbit I clearly can't catch. Thank you. Growing up in the 1840s and going into the 1850s, Light Hair would have heard about the devastation about the wagon trains and having the buffalo hunts were getting shorter and shorter. He also would have heard about the diseases the immigrants brought into the tribes. His takeaway from the childhood, however, would have been that the Americans weren't really trustworthy, but it was okay to trade with them because it really wasn't a bad thing. You just had to be careful what you told them. It is believed that he was around during the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851, but depending on what year he was born, he either would have been six years old or 11. We won't go into a huge amount of detail, and I'm going to try my best not to repeat the phrase, as you'll remember in Red Cloud's episode, but there's a lot of rehashing in this one. So if you are a little bit lost go back and listen to our Red Cloud episode and then also our Fort Laramie Treaty episode because it is all happening at the same time that we're not going to go into quite as much detail as we did during his episode. So So keep that in mind. timelines are side by side. Yes, Red Cloud is the generation before and then you're going to see Light Hair or Future Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull take over after really the Fort Laramie Treaty because we really did sum up Red Cloud's life really quickly after the Fort Laramie 1868 treaty. But as a refresher, going into the Fort Laramie 1851 treaty, the Americans tried to establish land territory for individual tribes. Not really the big reservation yet, but like you have your corner over here, the Crow have their corner over here, that type of thing. And the the Americans would then be allowed to build forts and then allow emigrants to use the wagon trail. In exchange, the tribes would get $50,000 in an annuity every year for the next 50 years. Do you want to guess what annuity they really wanted to push during the next 50 years? Five bucks a year. Oh, no, no, no. They, they, what equipment, what equipment they wanted to give them. And it was absolutely farming. Farming. Ah, farming equipment. Always farming. If anything, the Americans were very persistent and very consistent during this time on what they wanted them to do. They had a game plan and they were sticking to it. They were. They were. It was almost like they weren't listening at all to what the tribes wanted and they were just pushing what they wanted the tribes to do. So they had them on mute. They had the mic on mute when they were talking. You know, I wonder if that was it. It was one big sky. You're not plugged in. You're not plugged in. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. The thought of Red Cloud trying to unmute a mic does does make me chuckle a little bit. I'm not gonna He's lie. It's like the video from right when COVID started of the lawyer that was a cat. Your your honor, I'm not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that. Boy, that was only like two years ago. Feels like forever. It felt like a decade. A decade actually passed, I think. COVID, God, it's. I know it's always going to be Took 10 years out of everybody. Took 10 years out of everyone, I'm telling you. Woofta. Anyway, when the Senate ratified the treaty, they reduced the treaty from the original 50 years to 10. And you best believe that they didn't then go back to renegotiate the tribes. It was just, well, now it's 10 years. We promised you 50, but now it's 10. However, during the negotiation, the tribes were told they were not to impede on the wagon train as the trains would only be about the width of the ruts of the wagon. I'd like to think they had ha ha right after that paragraph. (laughs) They're all going to be single lined. And let me tell you, as someone who works that runs a district's food program, lining up anything in a single line doesn't work really that well. Unless you want some chaos towards the end. Not even. They're just going to bump because people, uh, Americans, we're an impatient group, if nobody could tell. If somebody is uh, going slow, they're just going to pass them. Trying to go around them. Yeah. Yep. There's a reason there's a horn on someone's car, and I don't think it's always just for emergencies. 
in order to combat the wagon train becoming wider and wider and wider, some warriors believe it would be just as easy if they could have them just stand on top of a ridgeline, them as in the warrior standing on a ridgeline, well within sight of the passing immigrants, just as a reminder that they're there. Sometime they would actually then just take one step closer until eventually they're near a river. Now, what I don't know is if they literally meant they wanted to push them in the river, which would be quite funny, or if they just wanted them near the riverbank so that they didn't like ruin all of the land. But regardless, this is really early on in the treaty that was supposed to keep peace for the end of times because everyone has their territories and we can use it. We can use the wagon trains and everything's great. It's not going well already. But I do need to say not all Sioux hated the deal. Some were perfectly fine staying in one place and actually farming. But by design, those who are trying to farm are more dependent on annuities and rations that needed to be handed out every year. Other bands not wanting to farm would still accept the rations and the annuities, but even three years after the treaty, annuities start to show up late or rotten, or just not at all, leading to hunger and starvation from all of the tribes. And now we're going to get to 1954, where if you remember, that was the same year as the Groton Massacre. 150-some women, men, and children, right? No, 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 Groton Massacre. So this is, for a refresher... Again, it's 1854. Light hair is either 9 or 14. And he was, again, he was there, but just kind of on the side. This was when a cow ventured on to Minikanju Sioux Village and was quickly butchered and eaten because That's they were right. literally starving. And they tried to come and seek retribution for it. Yes, they did. The government-appointed leader named Conquering Bear offered to pay for the cow, but the owner of the cow wasn't hearing any of it or wanted a price that was far beyond what the cow was worth. Yeah, I was going to say he wanted some some stupid astronomical, like, 20 times worth what it actually was. If I remember right, it was, the cow was probably worth, uh, I think it was Tom Clancy's book um, on Red Cloud. It was $5 is what the cow was worth, and the the owner wanted, like, $25, $30 for it. Uh, instead, so Conquering Bear is trying to just make this problem go away. When the Americans demand that the man who butchered the cow be pushed over, Conquering Bear doesn't have any control, any authority over the Minikanju, so he's not really able to do so. But the Americans don't like that answer. The second day, Lieutenant Gratton uh, led an armed detachment of 30 men and again, the incredibly drunk and bad translator. Hmm. Now, does that ring a bell? Oh, yeah. As soon as he said the cow, it all came flooding back. At the end, long story short, Groton and his men are all killed and all of their bodies are mutilated. It should be said, though, Groton did shoot first. Important point later. And it was a translator's fault. Here we go. There was a lot to blame there. <laughs> Groton was looking for a fight. The translator trying to pick a fight. It just it wasn't a good situation. All over a GD cow, by the way. Worth One Mormon's bucks. cow. Yeah. Could have all been settled really quickly. So Light Hair and a, and a childhood friend are actually there viewing the aftermath. They had never actually seen a dead white man before. So without really knowing the consequences yet, the young boys are just as excited as the other Lakota are after the attack. But then the consequences come. And the consequences come in the form of rations being withheld. From what? They're already not getting anything. Yeah, that's just it. <laughs> like, like, what are you going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going you're gonna to cut the air you're, you're giving us back in half or what? Yeah, there's no... There's no understanding of what the actual problem is, so we're just going to take things from you because we don't really want to listen to your problems. 
one of the first times that L- that light hair is able to kind of prove his bravery is when those rations are being withheld when him and a band of the look of, of his Oglala actually raided uh, a storage shed and they actually take some of those annuities and they're actually able to do it uninterrupted. So 14 years old already stealing. That's great. Like already going on raids. However, during the attack on Groton, conquering bear, if you remember was mortally wounded but he doesn't die right away. In fact, he held on for quite a while. Light hair actually is tending to him as he dies. And after his death, a very emotional light hair finds a horse and takes a ride north and rides up to a ridge with a storm in the distance. And he sits by himself. I'm going to take this part out of Joseph Marshall, the third's book, who is a native who actually is a Lakota. Um, so it's actually a really fascinating book to read into, but his book is uh, The Journey of Crazy Horse, and I'm just going to read what happened. So, White Hair lays down near the ridge as a thunderstorm approaches. He lays his feet towards the thunderstorm as if that is where the power came, came from. His dream of a, he dreams of a small lake, bursting upwards from blue calmness. A horse and its rider broke through the surface and rode out onto the land. The rider was a man a slender man who wore his hair loose with a stone tied behind his left ear, a reddish brown stone. A lightning mark was painted across the side of the face and on his bare chest were, were painted blue hailstones behind him to the West. As he galloped to the dark was a rolling cloud rising higher and higher. It came from a deep rumble of thunder and flashes of lightning. The horse was strong and swift and it changed colors. Red, yellow, black, white, blue. Suddenly, bullets and arrows filled the air, flying at the horse and the rider, but they all passed without touching him. Above him, through it all, was a red-tailed hawk, sending out its shrill cry. People, his own kind, suddenly rose up all around and grabbed the rider, pulling him down from behind. End quote. Really powerful dream. Light hair is then woken up by his father, who is now standing above him scared. And his father tells me, we need to get out of here because we're actually in an area where the Pawnee have been scouting. He then tells us on the way back, he tells his father of the dream he had. Are they like racing out of the area or is it more of like a let's pack up camp and go? Pack like, up how camp did that and work? Go. Okay. Because so when they see like Pawnee scouts and stuff, it's not like a immediate like, oh, crap, we are in trouble or pack it. Go, 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 go. It's more of like a right. it's time to move on. So this is our last day at, at this, kind of, in this area. It's more of a you're young. You're a young teenage boy who could be captured or killed if you're just laying out here. Oh, that's where it comes. And, and when you see the scouts, it's like, nope, not even going to take the chance. Let's just. Yep. We got to get out of here. Um. But when he tells his father his dream, his father, again, is a holy man. He takes it very seriously. In fact, he believes his son is what is called a thunder dreamer. A thunder dreamer have the ability to have powerful dreams that have the ability to read into the future. Dreamers would also come with responsibilities of being great leaders in fights who would not talk about their triumphs or raids in the battlefield. So this isn't just a a daydream. His father takes this 100% literal. You may be a special type of a person here. Like you may have some real influence coming. Spoiler alert. He is. Boom. Mic drop. We'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Let's find out. Don't you take my lines. (laughs) Do you just want to take over from here? (laughs) (laughs) That's it. You're doing Sitting Bull. You're doing the next episode. (laughs) I want an episode off. I'd be so lost. (laughs) I'd enjoy it. You'd be like, "Mm -hmm. okay, what next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Light hair comes down from the ridge as a more serious, somber, and more reclusive person. Now, he's only a teenager, so it's not really known if this has been his personality before. 
but it does seem like there is a very clear difference between what he was before and what he is after having this dream. He begins to make his dream a reality. So they find a reddish brown stone and he pierces his ear and he wears it on his left ear. He finds the plants of the colors to make the blue hailstones and paste them on his chest. He then finds the plants again to make the yellow lightning mark for him to wear on his chest. However, you can't just claim to be a thunder dreamer and people go along with it. So he has to, he has to prove himself and they test his vision in a few different raids. He is handed a war club and a single shot muzzle loader, which is the same combination he is going to use or for the rest of his life. On the first raid, it goes well, but no scalps are taken. And that's really what he's looking for. Like he's looking for that first scalp. On another, light hair is grazed by friendly fire in the knee and is forced to sit on another raid. So again, 0 for 2. He's doing well in these raids. He's not exactly running, but there's just not that big success yet. Raid number three goes into Omaha territory. While the more veteran warriors are going over on how to attack, they do not notice as the Omaha are already starting to fight, as in they're ambushing them right now. In the fog of war, Whitehair finally gets his first kill. He has a clean kill from his bow through the chest. But as he, but he really wants that scalp, so he jumps off of his horse, crawls to the body, only to realize he killed a woman. <gasps> oh no. His first kill is literally a oh no. A civilian. Yeah. Ashamed, he doesn't collect the scalp and he heads back. But despite the failure, he does again. He's holding his own. It's just it's just not as good. It, it, it's just level with everyone. There's nothing that just gets him over that hill that says, yeah. But he has to have improved himself enough because they, one, they keep sending him on raids. And they're also not combating, mm, like, they're not really fighting that he's a Thunder Dreamer. Like, they clearly believe this young boy is special. And this is where the sources are really going to hurt him. And also, I should probably point out, they go on so many raids. <laughs> so many. Let's do another. But we just got, let's do another. Seriously, they don't stop raiding. So every time that there's a long gap, like in, in the storyline, um, there might be something written down for him. But it's honestly, they went to the raid. They came back. They went to the raid. They came back. They raided this tribe. They came back. Repeat that forever because they never stop raiding. So I'm not going to talk too much about raids from here on out, but just know it's always and often. When they raid, that's more of like a, just a survival thing, correct? Like they're trying to get like resources and or is it more of a like, this is our area. You stay out. All of the above. It's this is our territory. We're mighty warriors. Uh, we're going to kick the crap out of you if you're on our territory. But it's also like your wealth was directly related to your horse herd in some tribes. Uh, sometimes you would just literally go raid and then come back with more like supplies and materials, hides, all of those things. So it's it's all of the reasons. But it's not really don't really look at it as like complete warfare, even though it is constant, constant fighting. And they definitely had war, but it's not, it's more, we're going to raid you. You're going to raid us. Uh, we're going to kill each other constantly, but this is just what we do. Like, it's really nothing to take personally, but this, this is just what we do. As weird as that sounds. <laughs> Upon returning to one of the raids, Lighthair is about to find out just how badly the Americans wanted revenge for Groton. And I should probably say, I really like Joseph Marshall III's book on Crazy Horse, but there's this particular story I could only find in his book when it comes to Spotting Tail being there. So he's going to talk about Chief Spotted Tail being in this camp. Everywhere else, I can find Chief Little Thunder and all the other details. But just maybe take a pinch of salt. It may have happened. I have no reason to doubt his book, but I, I could only find it in this particular book. So anyway, enough talking about that. Let's just actually go on with it. After Groton, 
and his command are taken out, the Americans send more troops into the area. One is Brigadier General William Harney, who sets out in the fall of 1855 and catches up with the Brule, with the Brule Lakota camp near modern-day Nebraska at Brule Water Creek. Harney rides his men toward Spotting Tail or Chief Little Thunder's camp. Spotting Tail, Spotted Tail rides out under, the, under his own white banner and smokes a pipe with Harney. And Harney tells him that he's here to take the men who kill Groton. Spotted Tail then sends a man back to warn the warriors that they need to prepare for a fight. Unaware that Harney has already sent his men to the village before the meeting even took place. Before Spotting Tail's me- Spotted Tail's messenger can arrive in the camp, the soldiers attack. Spotted Tail is now trapped with Harney and about 10 other men. Spotted Tail grabs a saber from a soldier, fights off uh, a few men, allegedly 10, and is only struck by a bullet himself. Very heroic. Really great. Again, I can only find that detail in one in one place. So I believe it happened. But there's my caveat. Meanwhile, back at the village, the village is starting to retreat. So Harney calls Chief Little Thunder and told him that his band will need to pay for the death of Groton. Little Thunder responded that he could not control the actions of the young people in his tribe, but they wanted peace. The army opened up fire and chased the villagers regardless until the cavalry and they chased the villagers into a cavalry waiting at the other end of the village. And it's a slaughter. About 86 natives, including women and children were killed with another 70 being captured. The village itself is burned down to the ground. Harney only losing 12 men. Those not nice people. They wanted peace. They did. And also like, and I think it, this is what, like we're going to talk a lot about raids and like we talk with Custer going to the Washita when native Americans kill like Groton or when we talk about Fetterman, they tend to call those massacres. Right. Mm -hmm. And then typically how it has been, it has gotten a lot better recently, but when the same thing happens to native Americans, it's been like, the fight at the Battle of the Washita, or this is the Blue Water Creek, uh, I guess, fight, but it's been listed as the Blue Water Creek Massacre. The difference between these battles, it's always native villages with women and children. The Americans are always coming to them. The army itself, as its forts, there's no women and children in these forts by design. It's always on the doorstep of the tribes. I just don't understand why they would like, why is everyone so bloodthirsty? Like he had a point like, Hey, we can't control what our youngins are going to do, but like, we still want peace. Like right. this was an unfortunate mis- ah, burn to the ground. A bunch of people, like you chase them into another waiting army. Yes. It like, was a plan to take. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like they knew going in that they were going to destroy this village. So I would, I think what gets really confusing and I can see if I'm not going to give Harney off the hook, but if let's just say you're a soldier or you're an everyday American and you have the Sioux, which is the term Sioux is a very general term because even the Sioux break into three different bands and all of those three different brands break off into smaller sections. So we just talked about how the man who killed the cow that led to the Grot massacre was Minikanju. Mm-hmm. Right. They just attacked a Brule Lakota band. They're not even the same people. So, and I guess the only way I could see it is if um, I live in, I live in Stanford, Connecticut right now, and we live far away. We live a little bit away from New Haven. It's almost as if like if New Haven would, I don't know, they would bomb New York city. And then New York City would send representatives to Stanford and say, we're really mad about what you did as a Connecticut, like as I guess we're called nutmeggers. I don't know. I'm learning this, whatever. (laughs) But because you're both uh, from Connecticut, we're going to hold you just as responsible. And they just don't see that 
it's it's different people. I don't have control over a different section of people. I don't know what to tell you. They just see a Native American and say, no, nope, that's the guys. Yeah. Those are the guys. Well, that's them right there. Right. You're all Sue. So I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, light hair is out hunting when he sees a large plume of smoke ri- rise from the ground and he instantly rides towards it. After traveling, he sees the smoke is coming from his village. And as he gets closer to the camp, the fight is over. And in fact, it's just barely over. He can see the soldiers actually leaving as he approaches the, his now destroyed village. He walks through the prayer graph and brushes and starts seeing the dead. Then he sees all the bodies were mutilated, women, children, elderly, and he does his best to cover every body that he finds. As he keeps going, he finds someone alive and he recognizes it as a woman who was visiting and her name was Yellow Woman. She is found with her lifeless baby in her arms. Oh, jeez. And she tells Lighthair that her husband was killed in front of her and then takes him to go see his body. They leave the baby and the husband together, bury them, and then they leave together. The two escape uh, once they return to Lighthair's tribe. Others can notice the resentment in Light Hair's eyes. Like this is really now the second. I mean, don't time you think you would be there. right? Yep, one hundred percent. The Lakota point to this as the last time Light Hair will ever trust the Americans again. He goes on a several day hunt alone and will not speak about the attack. He focuses anger on to raids into Snake Country. Again, light hair, trying to make his vision a reality, wears the symbols from his belt, from his vision, even finding a red-tailed hawk feather to put in his hair. When they find the snakes, light hair, armed again with uh, his muzzle and his bow, jumps on horseback and charges a man who uh, ends up killing him with his rifle. As he rides on, Light Hair's horse is killed underneath him, and he's saved by a childhood friend or mentor named High Backbone. And while riding on High Backbone's horse, Light Hair kills a few snake warriors with an arrow. He jumps down to finally take his first scalp and then immediately collapses in pain because he got shot in the back of the knee. Oh, oh, God. That is the right reaction because that. That would be some pain. I think I got a crip. Nope, that's 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 something nope. in there. That's something in there. This isn't quite Forrest Gump getting shot in the shot in the buttocks, but that had to be a real downer to finally get your first scalp that you have been trying for, only to get shot in the knee. Despite this, the raid is a success, and you could finally say that he's the Thunder Dreamer. He's finally take that first scalp. He's done it. He did really well. Thunder. (laughs) Oh, that is 100%. Well, except for he's now very somber and stoic, so he's just, he's very sad faced. But you can still picture Thunderstruck in the background because that's pretty awesome. As he's he's standing up with his like injured knee, you know, and he's like, Thunder. And then he's just like, all of a sudden a guy, like a man now, like a different dude, like a different actor in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> what if as he's going back into his village, everyone is just doing ah, ah, ah and then like the actual actual thunder goes oh, 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 ah, ah, like ooh, I like this a whole lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> this dude means business now. I want just one time I want that to happen in my life. Like just I don't next thunderstorm, I'm going out in the middle of it and I'm paying people to do that. <laughs> That was just, all, so just cool. all bunches and bunches of random people just going, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and you're like, oh crap, <laughs> oh god, it's real. We got to go inside. I'm not brave. I'm not brave at all. Anyway, he is limping into tra- into camp because he was just shot, and Light Hair's father informed him instead of being like, hey, hey, son, good job. I'm sure that happened, but. Instead of saying, good job, but do you know why you were shot in the knee? It's because you attempted to take a scalp. In which Lighthair had to be like, yeah? 
what did you, duh, the, what, what do you think we were doing all this time? This was the point, wasn't it? Apparently it wasn't the point. Because when you take a scalp, you're actually taking credit for the raid. You're kind of bragging about what you have done. That's the whole point of collecting scalps, right? While recovering, however, it's it's gone. But that's your punishment. Instant karma for taking the scalp as you got shot in the back of the knee. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate that. But while he's recovering, Light here walks out or wakes up one morning to the song of his Oglala band singing just outside of his lodge. And as he walks out, he sees his family, his father, and the rest of the band around his his lodge. As the song completes, his father said, quote, I give you my first son a new name on this day. I have heard the story of the brave things she did. I am proud. Your mothers are proud. All of your family is proud, and friends are proud of our young man. So this day, I will give you a new name. I will give you the name of his father and his father before him. And on this day forward, I will call him Crazy Carl. Carl. Oh, Crazy Carl. Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Sorry, I, ru- I totally ruined that epic moment. <laughs> I th- I would love if that actually happened. Like somebody was really eager and like was really digging it. Like, oh man, I'm I'm motivated for him. And then I shall name you Carl. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone just looks at him like the f he just said. <laughs> yeah, it's just that it's just the guy no one likes in the back. <laughs> Do you? You know, that's exactly what happened. He was, he's now Carl Horse. There's not, it's Carl Horse. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. We are setting the record straight. Yep. Yeah, there's, yeah. You know, I was, I was all ready to go into the Thunderstruck thing again. So like, I will name him Crazy Horse. And then they went to, da. I know when I was listening, when I was listening to you talk to it, I'm like, this had to have been such a great moment. <laughs> I got to ruin it. <laughs> And your name forever will be Carl. <laughs> what do you mean? The th- the, there's a storm and then it just it instantly stops. <laughs> oh, wait. wait what? Nope. Yeah, that's right. The gods are like, nope, you ruined it. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> You're a monster. Um, If you wanted to have a step down for a name, you could actually go look at Crazy Horse's dad. Uh, because he also adopts a new name because you can't have two crazy horses. That was going to be my next question. When they when they take over their name, they give that up then? Sometimes. This case, he did. Sitting Bull, I don't believe they will. But, oh, no, that's true. They, he does change it. They, his father changed his name, too. But anyway, fancy a guess. It's not Carl. What his father takes as his name? Um, crazy No More. Worm. What? Worm. W O R M. Why? I wonder why. <laughs> he's looking over. He's like, I will no longer be called Crazy Horse. I'll be uh, uh, looking at a tree. Uh, worm. <laughs> worm. <laughs> Man, you could have just taken your time and just, like, you could have really thought of a name. How do you go from Crazy Horse to Worm? It's a real step down, isn't it? I mean, is that him basically saying I'm retired? Yeah, I'm just, I don't have a cool name anymore. So I just guys leave me alone. And now, if you're Lakota and you and you know that story, why he would choose worm? I'm going to assume probably because a worm does a lot of like recycles the earth and like does all of that type of thing. Like it's, it's very important animal, I guess. Thing is it an is a worm an animal? I don't know. A worm's not uh, anything. In no, it's not an insect. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know if I care either, but if you are Lakota or you know that story, let us know. It's 1861 and Crazy Horses is celebrating his new name. Red Cloud is starting to begin his attacks on the Americans. He's looking for men to scout and keeps an eye on Fort Laramie. 
Crazy Horse is chosen to be one of those men to keep an eye on the fort. While at Fort Laramie, they successfully raid and steal the horses, which I understand Fort Laramie isn't what it's going to be, but that's still pretty cool that they, like, we think of Fort Laramie as the fort on the plains, and they just took all their horses one day. Because they could. However, when they ride back from that raid, they hear word about the Sand Creek Massacre. Again, we'll do Sand Creek in detail to actually do it justice, but this is when uh, Shivington, John Shivington went in and just massacred uh, a whole bunch of Sioux Village, similar to what Custer did. But this one really affects the Lakota. Heartbreakingly for Crazy Horse, one of the victims is Yellow Woman. <gasps> no! Survived one massacre to go into another. By the Americans. By the Americans. Hearing the news, again, Crazy Horse hides out alone for the next couple of days. And according to Joseph M. Marshall III, he keeps reflecting back on his advice his father had told him years ago. Now, we haven't gone over this quote, but his father tells him, quote, we must stop them or we will be fighting them at our lodge doors. The Lakota and other Plains tribes struggle to deal with the consequences of Sand Creek Massacre. Specifically, what do they do with all of this anger they have towards the Americans? Well, the answer is they're going to plan a lot of attacks and they're going to execute as many people as they can. One of the first is near Julesburg, where they meet a stockade of soldiers and plan an ambush, where the anger of the young warriors rush in before they signal and they spoil the ambush. The soldiers are able to make a small skirmish lines and then form a retreat. Damn. All the Lakota can do is scold their young men and plan another. Attempt number two sees Red Cloud leading his, the men. Crazy Horse uh, being one of, one of them. Again, just like the attack before, the young warriors ruin the ambush and they charge too soon. Two straight attacks in a row that have been a failure. Understanding that this can't continue to happen, you can't have your own men sabotage your own attacks, the Lakota are going to bring back an old tradition known as a shirt wearer. The tradition has been abandoned for generations because it has been less about who has been the best fighter, but rather uh, fathers would pass it on to their sons. What a shirt wearer is... It would be described by an elder as not just a battle position, like not just a basically a command on a fight or on the battlefield, but it was, quote, to wear the shirts, you must be a man above all others. You must help others before you think of yourselves. Help the widows and help those who have little to wear and to eat and to those who have no one else to help for. And to speak for them. Do not look down on them or others. And they, they see and you make sure they do not look down on you. And do not let your anger guide your mind or your heart. Be generous. Be wise. And show fortitude so that the people can follow you. And do as you do. And above all, have courage and be the first to charge the enemy. For it is better to die a warrior naked in death than to be wrapped well in the heart. Or to be wrapped up well and the heart of a wa with water inside. A lot more than just a rank on a battlefield. You have to be the ideal man, warrior. You have to be the ideal in your village. Right. Crazy Horse is given one of these shirts, where the whoops and the yells were supposedly louder for him than anyone else that earned a shirt that day. Bringing back the shirt wear will do what it's intended to do, while it's never going to be as organized as the American counterparts, at least there is someone with experience that the war, that the young men can look at, that they can wait, that they will wait, they will respect it, and there's going to be some type of organization. In 1866, the U.S. Interior Department called upon thousands, including the Brule, the Bruel or the Leo Glala, to meet at Fort Laramie for a treaty that would allow settlers and spectators and speculators to safe passes on the Bozeman Trail. 
We talked about this briefly in Red Clothes episode, but this isn't the Fort Laramie 1851 treaty, nor the 1868 treaty. This is a couple years before. The treaty negotiated does not go well because the Americans have already decided to start building forts on the Bozeman Trail, if you remember that. The U.S. War Department sends Colonel Henry B. Carrington into the Powder River Basin with about 700 troops. That name also, Red Cloud's episode. This move angered Red Cloud, who refused to sign the treaty, but instead attack without mercy throughout 1866. And if you remember from his episode, this is where Carrington writes back to his superiors in Washington saying that we've had all of this success Uh, seriously, guys, loads of success, but if you wouldn't mind, could you please send us uh, a lot more men, supplies and ammunition because we're doing great though. We're doing great. Everything's fine. Just, just a lot more like, you know, a couple thousand. That'd be great. Please, please, God, God, please. We're doing great. I swear. I think we joked about on the letter. You could actually see the tear. Like, Oh yeah, that's right. I remember that. Yeah. Because they were getting their butt kicked. Oh, they sure were. It was constant, constant attacks. Red Cloud wants to do one big fight, but he doesn't just want to rush in. So he calls on a medicine dreamer and asks for his advice on the next move. When the medicine dreamer rode on his pony, he then rides around the warriors gathered around him. The dreamer appeared to be plucking things out of the air and placing them in his hand. And he does a few laps around the warriors, and when he returns to Red Cloud on the 4th, he said that he declared that he had a vision that he had a 100 blue coat soldiers, or American soldiers, in each hand. So what he was plucking out of the air were soldiers and putting them in his hand. Believing this would be a good omen, Red Cloud strategizes an attack. That is what we're going to go with. The plan, and this is going to sound really familiar, the plan was for the Lakota to hide about five miles outside of Fort Phil Kearney on both sides of the trail as soldiers commonly used to gather firewood. They would then send decoys to draw them out around the time wagons open up the doors of the fort so they can gather firewood. The decoys would fire at the wagon train and then fall back, hopefully hoping that the soldiers would follow. When they did follow a couple miles outside, the Lakota would spring their trap on a trail on both sides of a road. The decoys needed the soldiers to believe that they were fighting about 10 warriors at a time and that they could easily be taken out. But considering the recent history the Lakota had on their ambushes, it's kind of a risky move because you still have eager young warriors who want to really, really fight. So they have to be careful about who they use to lead this charge and who they specifically need to use the decoys. Because if the decoys can't get them there, it's not going to matter. And then the The decoys could die. Yes. The man they chose to lead the decoys is Crazy Horse. He'll get it done. Now, all of this should sound a little familiar. So Carrington's coming in. This is actually going to be the Fetterman fight. So you remember the second one? I think you originally thought this was the Groton Massacre when we talked about it earlier. I think you originally said Fetterman. Uh, this was the big blow-off at the end of Red Cloud's War. So it is December 21st, 1866. Crazy Horse sets up near a thick brush and waits. It is said to be a bitterly cold day, well below zero degrees Fahrenheit. When the young warriors are set off five miles down the road, And as the decoys are set, Crazy Horse waits. When the doors finally open to Fort Phil Kearney, the men come out to gather firewood. Once they do so, Crazy Horse steps out and immediately starts drawing fire from the soldiers. As soon as that first volley of fire comes out, the other decoys come out, but they don't charge. All of this being done well within sight of the fort, but just outside the artillery range. As the wagons engage, the decoys see that the gates to the fort open up and a cavalry unit led by Fetterman come out. 
Crazy Horse and his men fire at the gate, baiting the soldiers to follow, which they eventually do. Again, the plan is to march five miles downrange, where they can go down a steep ridge, and that's where the real ambush was to take place. For now, the young warriors are still sitting, back outside the fort, in an effort to bait them, Crazy Horse jumps off of his horse, well within rifle range, and calmly cleans the ice from the hooves of his horse. Oh my gosh. Oh, don't mind me, guys. Tink, 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 tink. Oh, something going on? Hmm. Do you remember, like, during Tommy Boy, when they're getting, they're on the side of the road and they get into a fight and David Spade starts punching Chris Farley? And then Chris Farley is like, oh, it's like, oh, it's like kissing your mother. Slap. (laughs) Oh, is there a wind in here? Slap. I feel like that's really what he's doing. If cleaning the ice off of his hooves wasn't enough, his next move is Crazy Horse and the other decoys actually start a fire. Oh, my gosh. That's hilarious. Aren't they getting fired at? Yes, they're getting fired upon, but they're not coming at them as as fast as they come. Okay, I guess we're going to... Oh, let's make some s'mores, s'mores? everyone. Yeah. <laughs> both at the exact same time. We, we both had the right idea. I like it. The soldiers finally get the hint, and just as Crazy Horse catches the flame to the fire, uh, a bullet whizzes right by his head. Oh... So thinking it's now might be time to go, they start going down the ridge. And as the troops advance, they advance. But as the troops slow down, they also slow down. And what is a scene that has to be straight out of Benny Hill, the decoys would do things as pretend to be shot off of their horses, or they would pretend that they were slipping on ice, whatever they could to make the soldiers go just a little bit farther. The fight-happy young warriors can now see the soldiers as they're coming down the ridge. But they need to wait until they are directly between them. The decoys need to be passed. The soldiers need to be right in between. And as the decoys get to the Lakota, the decoys are now starting to draw the heaviest fire they have so far. When they are finally in place, the signal is given to attack and, quote, each line of riders swinging out wide and when crossing each other on the opposite side of the creek. Immediately, several hundred warriors now surrounded Fetterman and his hundred men. Fetterman and his men dismount and form a skirmishing line and try to fight off the warriors as they head back up the ridge. And if you remember, Carrington told them many times not to go over that ridge. But now he needs to go back up it. An estimated 40,000 arrows later, Fetterman was found with his men near the top of a slope as they tried to find some rocks to cover. All 80 of his men are wiped out. The Lakota suffered about 15 gone. The Americans remember this as the Fetterman fight or the Fetterman massacre. The Lakota remember it from the Medicine Dreamer's vision as the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand. This proved to be the final blow for the Americans fighting Red Cloud. As constant raids go on and continue throughout 1867 and 1868, the Americans called to negotiate uh, the Fort Laramie Treaty around April 1868 and thus ends Red Cloud's war. Or if you remember, Red Cloud refused to come down during the talks until the Americans proved that the forts would be abandoned. Basically missing 75% of the negotiations if you choose to call it a negotiation before that. The Americans are able to then establish the Great Sioux Reservations, which confided all Lakota territory down considerably. For Crazy Horse, though, he's just going on more raids. Man needs more fighting. His signature does not go on the treaty, and when he hears about the territorial boundaries, he scoffs at it. 
Lakota territory to him was a majority of modern day Western South Dakota and the Powder River Company in Nebraska and going on to Wyoming, Montana. Sorry, not Wyoming. To be put into a smaller territorial box was ludicrous to him. Red Cloud went from the most respected war chief to in Sioux history at the time of the treaty and shortly after loses almost all respect from those who didn't agree to the treaty. Crazy Horse biographer uh, Joseph Marshall III says, quote, The paper had no power over the lives of the Lakota. We are Lakota, and these are our lands, and we will not be put into our lodges here, nor because no one man can speak on his mark on a paper. A paper with words that could not be known or understood even by the wisest Lakota. The white man can use those words, change these words, and fit the truth to his needs. I think it's important to point out here that Crazy Horse is not a chief of his band, but he is obviously a well-respected war leader. So he doesn't spend a lot of time focusing on the Fort Laramie Treaty other than he knows there's now two distinct bands. There's Treaty Lakota, or sometimes they're called loafers. There's a lot of different names about them. There's non-treaty and treaty uh, Lakota. Does this cause fighting within the group? It's an immediate divide, yes. And I think what we also need to remember is that Red Cloud is on the reservation. I don't want to say this like breaks his spirit, but he never will fight the Americans again. But that doesn't mean he likes what's going on. He doesn't just accept it. But to those who didn't sign the treaty, he may as well have. He may as well be the one, the cheerleader next to it, saying that you're the reason this all happened. Right. So he was at the height of his game, and then this happened, and now he literally is a nobody. Like, no one wants him. He loses a lot of respect. So I've heard most Lakota go on to the, to the, to the reservation, but I don't know. I don't know where, where, how they define most. <laughs> Cause I remember from his episode two, after this doesn't, isn't it pretty much like he even changes his name, right? He gets like an Americanized name and he takes an American. Name the rest as, of days. Yeah. He does convert to Christianity and he does take on an American name, but I think he's still, he's still known as red cloud. I don't think that it's, I think it's kind of, he just had his white name and he had his, his Indian name. Right. Is how they would call it. So anyway, that's on the reservation. Crazy Horse again didn't sign the reserva- didn't sign the treaty, doesn't want anything to do with it. So he's just going to raid, and he raids until it's basically 1970 or 1870. 1970, that would be a twist. Wow! Well, you can tell by the way I use my looks. I'm a woman's man. <laughs> the amount of culture shack. <laughs> Uh, he just walks around, what? <laughs> so 1870. 1870. It is, it is 1870. Okay. Uh, he's He wishes it was 1970, though, because 1870 Crazy Horse is kind of caught up in a scandal. <gasps> because he's actually caught with a married woman. Crazy Horse. Oh, my gosh. Her name is Black Buffalo Woman. Her husband, whose name is No Water, had a reputation for being a drunk, which may have led Black Buffalo Woman to look towards divorcing him. Now, divorce for the Lakota, comparative to today, was fairly straightforward. You just leave and you go live with someone else. However, when you go leave and live with someone else, whoever you're living in with needs to give something back to now the ex-husband. Like, you kind of need to, like, hear... Your three horses worth kind of thing. Well, Crazy Horse doesn't do that. So I don't know how much time has passed, but as a shirt wearer, do you remember that you need to be like the ultimate citizen type thing? Yep. It's not a good look. No Water tracks down Crazy Horse and Black Buffalo Woman on a hunt and found them together in the same teepee. No Water called out Crazy Horse's name from the outside, and when Crazy Horse answered... No water stuck his pistol directly in the teepee. Crazy Horse's cousin, who was sitting near the entrance, knocked the pistol upward as no water fired, deflecting the bullet 
but it still hits Crazy Horse in his jaw. Oh my word. He's oh he oh he could have died. Yeah. Yep, that could have been real. Now getting hit in the jaw isn't great, but it's not dead. Uh No Water then flees with Crazy Horse's relatives in hot pursuit. No Water was so scared he literally ran his horse until it died and then continued on foot until he got to his village. He was that scared of uh Crazy Horse? Right. That would you I would be. But yes. What did I do? What did I do? What do I do? Crazy Carl's coming after me. Carl! Never gonna let you forget that one. Uh after a lot of talking, not from Crazy Horse because he was just shot in the jaw, but after a lot of talking and a lot of near violence, several old elders convince Crazy Horse and No Water that there shouldn't be any more fighting. And as payment, No Water gives Crazy Horse three three horses, which... Wait, wait, wait. No Water gives Crazy Horse three horses? He did just shoot him in the jaw. He took his wife! His wife left. <laughs> Just happened to go to Crazy Horse. So you're telling me No Water not only lost his wife, but also three horses. Dude's getting the end of the stick. I mean, he did shoot a well-respected war leader in, well, yeah. you know, with the intent to kill. So, like, let's let's not. And also, uh, there's a reason she was divorcing him. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So before we before we wag our finger, um. The drama involving Black Buffalo Woman does take a really long time for Crazy Horse to regain his reputation. And in fact, he gets stripped of his shirt. He's no longer a shirt wearer. Dang. They took it serious. Yeah, I mean, it was a big deal. Yeah. However, he is able, after a few short years... He's able, he's leading about 200 families. Again, he's not a chief. He's influential war leader, not chief. Crazy Horse wouldn't end up marrying Black Buffalo Woman and instead married a woman named Black Shawl, who actually helped tend to him as he was healing from his shot. The two have a daughter together. However, the child does die in infancy when Crazy Horse uh, returns home from a raid. Uh, he hears about the death of his daughter. So it's not... Did it, did it say how she died or was it like illness? Or? I believe it was illness. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I do believe it was illness. As we mentioned before, the Lakota are split between reservation Sioux, sometimes named loafers, who would brag about just how easy and great their life was on the reservation, while the quote unquote wild Sioux were trying just simply to not starve to death. Uh, because of dwindling buffalo herds, which are now being shot by for sport. Uh, those who were hunting the buffalo would then just leave the rotting carcasses out for the natives to find. Crazy Horse's belief is that the only way to fix this is to literally fight any non-Indian on the plane. However, he only has about 150 men, so he's going to need some time to build up. Until then, he'll have to wait. So again, while he's he's waiting... He goes on a heck of a lot more raids. So we're going to let him raid and we're going to talk about gold. We did talk about how rumors in the Black Hills having gold have been around since before the Civil War. Small mining camps have already been in out uh, and the Lakota were already attacking the gold seekers who entered. But as it turns into 1873, the U.S. Army, including Custer, are now scouting the area for gold. And in fact, gold is found by Custer. Americans now are going to come into the Black Hills at a much faster clip than they had before. Crazy Horse is mourning the death of his daughter while all of this is going on, as well as raiding. In May 1875, a delegation of Lakota chiefs, including Red Cloud, come to the White House to protest shortages of government rations and corrupt Indian agents. President Grant said that the government's treaty obligations to issue rations had read out, had actually ran out, and it could be revoked. The rations continued only because of Washington's kind feelings towards the Lakotas. 
So let's unpack that for a second. They signed this treaty to make them, as obviously during the Fort Laramie Treaty episode, we talked about how badly they wanted them to be farmers. Well, this is five, this is seven years after that. They should be able to grow their own crops. But because of a few reactors, one, the Lakota weren't farmers beforehand, and it takes a little bit of a time to adjust to it. And also keep in mind, the western half of South Dakota, where the Great Sioux Nation Reservation is, is not ideal farming land. There are farms out there, but most of the agriculture are actually is on the east side of the state. When you get near the Black Hills, it's a lot more rocky. It's more grazing and ranch than it is planting crops. But because Grant... How do I want to phrase this? I like Grant. I really, really like Ulysses S. Grant. However, this is this is the worst thing he will ever do. So anyway... He's saying that we're only giving you rations because of our kind feelings towards you. Never mind that we're trying to turn you into something you aren't, but regardless. Secondly, Grant goes on. Grant, again, was the leader of the army, says that he is powerless to prevent miners from overrunning the Black Hills and that the Lakotas must cede the rest or lose their rations give us your land or quite literally starve Star. after the shock of an offer that seemingly came out of the blue wears off there's a few weeks of talk where the lakota just break it off and leave the new york herald reported that they returned to the res- reservation quote disgusted and not conciliated Grant gave, and I can't put this in quotes enough, negotiations one more try. He appointed a commission to hold a grand council on the Great Sioux Reservation, uh, and he wanted to buy the mining rights to the Black Hills. The ground council was called in September 1875, but again, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull are not there. According to Peter Cozens, it's a fairly lengthy quote, but it is worth going into. Quote, subchiefs and warriors from the non-treaty Lakota villages did attend the council, but to intimidate reservation chiefs who might yield, gate-crashing whites, some well-meaning and others with questionable intent, advised the reservation chiefs that the Black Hills were worth tens of millions of dollars more than what the commission was prepared to offer. Those chiefs said that they would be willing to sell if the government paid enough to sustain their people for seven generations to come. The commission sent word back to Washington that its, quote, ample and liberal offer had been met with, quote, derisive laughter from the Indians was inadequate. The Lakota could not begin to be brought to terms, quote, except by a mild exercise, at least a force in the beginning. So that is the complete quote from Peter Cosens. To sum all of that up, you had... Other miners basically coaching the chiefs saying you needed, you shouldn't accept this offer unless they give you a ridiculous amount of money because seriously, they're about to rake you over the coals. Some wanted that because they wanted to mine it themselves and others actually had them in mind. The commission basically gets frustrated that they didn't, that the Lakota didn't accept their offer and then saying, well, they'll eventually accept it but we're going to have to use some force before they accept it. So basically they're backing up Grant's plan of, well, if you don't take the money, you can starve. But in this case, you, if you don't take the money, we're going to kill you. I love that deal. I take that deal every day of the week. Isn't it? So again, a frustrated, pre- now that's advisors going back to Grant. Grant is frustrated and it's, we need to keep in mind that America is in the second year of an economic crisis. Grant really needs that gold. And if negotiations weren't going to work, then according to a journal entry by George Crook, quote, General Grant had decided 
that the Northern Sioux, i.e. the Lakotas, should go to the reservation or be whipped. That is a direct quote from quote from from Grant to Crook. He gives that order in December 1875 that all the Sioux tribes that were not on the reservation would be considered hostile if they were not on the on the reservation by January 1876. He made that offer again in December 1875. So about a month notice in the winter time. Right. And it's not like they can, it's not like everyone just gets like a little ping on their cell phone. Correct. Got it. So um, I take it a lot of them didn't get the memo and we're still on the land. Well, keep in mind those, those who were not on there, then also the Lakota are able to leave the reservation to go on Buffalo hunts, but you're not really doing that in the winter. You're doing that in the fall. So all of those who are on the reservation, to be fair, are already on the reservation. So you are, you're basically those who are rebelling against the treaty. Uh, you're basically the forcing them to worry. On. Right. Yeah. So they weren't going to be coming anyway. So maybe it doesn't matter when that decree happens, but if you logistically, if you're going to make this charade, at least give them time to go back on it, make it look like a legitimate offer or like right. a legitimate thing. On the Lakota side, we need to explain why they don't want to sell the Black Hills. Now, the Black Hills, if you're looking at the time the Lakota had been in the territory, they only have been in the Black Hills or Western South Dakota for about 70 years, which when you hear from people, that's always the con that's that's normally the first thing they say is that the Sioux were not on the land that long to really like build up like all of this attachment to the Black Hills, basically saying that they're crying foul, like they're really not sincere and why they want to be there. They had been there. The Western Sioux or the Lakota had been pushed back west as the Americans were moving west. Also, the crunch of the Americans moving natives west shoved the Lakota farther farther in so they originally i believe were in minnesota like that ohio so like think of tecumseh's time they're in minnesota and then as they they keep getting pushed back until basically the the missouri river it is believed that they settled in the black hills around the 1870s you would be fair to ask why a nomadic tribe dependent on following buffalo herds would be so attached to the black hills and in short, it has everything to do with beliefs. In the Black Hills is a place called Wind Cave. And you can actually walk the caverns today if you go there. As the name would suggest, near the entrance and exits of the cave, air pressure releases gusts of winds, making it appear that the cave is breathing. The Sioux believe that the mother of the four winds named Ait and the other and another god named Iktami. I'm sorry if I butchered that, butchered that, but they believe that they gave birth to the Sioux out of these caves. They quite literally walked out of Wind Cave. For the Sioux to entertain any offers of purchasing the Black Hills, it would be like asking a Christian, what is your price on Jerusalem? It ain't happening. It's not. So if anybody does say, well, the Sioux weren't there long enough to have attachments. There, there is your answer. Crazy Horse and the Lakota find these mining camps and are surprised to learn that the miners do not actually put lookouts for protection. They're all but inviting the highly motivated Lakota to attack. We have seen before that in quick ambushes, that's typically goes to the advantage to the tribes. Most miners will only have a single shot firearm and bows and arrows can repeat a lot faster than those single shot firearms. Crazy horse again, just leads over just easily overruns multiple mining camps. The wild Lakota, again, those who didn't agree to the treaty have been looking more towards sitting bull who at this point is over 50 and has over 70 battles of honor to his name. He wields enough power and influence more than anyone that they can remember, including Red Cloud. 
And this is only, this is less than a decade after Red Cloud has really wielded his power. Sitting Bull has just been in the background, just accruing. Sitting Bull calls out for a big council to meet on the greasy grass, hoping to influence the Lakota men into a rebellion. How much influence does he have? Well, an estimated 10,000 Lakota show up for his sun dance ceremony on the greasy grass or near the Little Bighorn River. So as we get to April 1876, the U.S. military is now heading out. So those who aren't on the reservation in January 1876, it's now April. Custer, Crook, Terry, all of them are now coming out to find them. But it's a lot harder to track down the Lakota than they would like to admit, even if there's 10,000 of them just hiding in the same spot. The Lakota are looking at eight. 1876 as a defining year regardless as this will either be their last year on the plains as free natives or they're going to be dead on a battlefield so to the lakota they have nothing else to lose sitting bull continues to sundance crazy horse is at little bighorn but is kind of as a bodyguard type. He keeps his eyes on the southern horizon where some natives believe the Americans might be, and it turns out they're right because distinguished Civil War hero Brigadier General George Crook and his company of about 1,200 men are marching north towards the gathering, so they're starting to surround them. Crazy Horse embraces his wife and covering himself and her in an elk robe. They don't say much to each other, But as Crazy Horse leaves, he jumps on his horse, and instead of going directly to the battlefield, he starts circling the village. Confused, young warriors soon realize that Crazy Horse is performing a ritual that hadn't been done since the Sand Creek Massacre. It's called Gathering the Warriors. He's just going to continue to circle the camp as more warriors continue to line up behind him. He does this enough so that eventually onlookers are not able to tell where the circle begins and where it ends. And during the fourth and final lap, the women begin singing a war song as well as start beating drums. By the end of the lap, an estimated 600 to 1,000 warriors are now ready to go fight George Crook a couple days later. And as they head towards him, an extra 400 to possibly 1,200 more join him over the next three days. They get to June 17, 1876, where Crook's column marched northward among a fork during the Rosebud Creek. The men had been riding hard, and Crook allows them to rest, but at 8 a.m., they hear shots coming from the north, shortly followed by two Crow scouts shouting, Lakota, Lakota. Crook orders his men on high ground to form battle lines and Crook would only order his cavalry to advance only when it looked like his lines were able to break. But to be honest, there's a lot of warriors that are coming his direction. It's not looking good for Crook and his men as they are completely surrounded. He has his men in good position, but he can only fight for so long. Just as it looks like Crook's lines are about to give in, The Custer's Luck Fairy makes an appearance, and he drizzles some dust on George Crook, because Crazy Horse is told that after the sixth hour of fighting, the Sioux are running low on ammunition. Oh, six hours? Oh my god. Couldn't imagine. That's too much fighting. Crook is on the ropes, but Crazy Horse has to leave the battlefield, and that's All that saves Crook. Thinking that Crook wouldn't follow because he wouldn't have enough ammunition himself, Crazy Horse retreats back to the greasy grass. Now, because there's no true conclusion to it, both sides can claim a victory. The Lakota, because they stood their ground and they were able to bring the fight to them for six hours, and Crook because they weren't all massacred on the site. So each side can take away just a little bit. But now you have the Lakota who just took on the army in June 1876, feeling really good about themselves. Unaware that on June 25th, 
George Custer is now outside the village. Now, if you remember from Custer's episode, he passes the aftermath of Crook's fight where they're picking up the dead and the warriors and they find that's how they know they're so close to this gathering. That is when Custer starts panicking that the tribes are about to run away. Now, in reality, the tribes are already starting to come down from this big ceremony. Like they're starting to like start to go home. So when Custer's men approach the Rosebud Creek fight, some of those men do flee. And that's when Custer's worst fear is. And on June 25th, a lone Lakota rider crosses the greasy grass and begins to shout, prepare yourselves. The soldiers are coming. The soldiers are coming. And almost instantly, a thousand fighting men are ready to greet Custer and his soldiers. They're screwed. Oh, they sure are. Now, in one of the more frustrating bits of research ever, I will read to you two quotes. And this is really all we have. Like, I'll read, there's a little bit more detail, but this is honestly, when it comes to Crazy Horse on this battle, he did something real great. But nobody wants to tell you what he did. One man named uh, Waterman said, quote, He was the bravest man I ever saw. He rode closest to the soldiers, yelling to his warriors. All the soldiers were shooting at him, but he was never hit. End quote. Another man named Little Soldier said, quote, He was the greatest fighter in the whole battle was Crazy Horse. End quote. That's kind of it. It's not really known what he does. People <laughs> he saw was great, him do it. He was great. People he was great saw doing him it. Do it. It was, he was the best. He was the absolute best at whatever he did. I saw it. Me too. Me too. But I wish the next question was, what did he do? And you just see, there's like, there's a website that I don't think had been updated since like 1999. It was real old school. I'm surprised it didn't crash. And it was like five pages of those type of quotes where you're just like, guys, <laughs> it's great. You have me hooked. He did something really, really great. More, please. Can we get more detail? Now, what he does do, this is what he may have done. It's not much, but it's what he may have done. But the soldiers are already disorganized as they come up to a lone ridge and they have nowhere else to go. So they decide to run forward and are cut down immediately quote by the Lakota who seemed to be rising out of the earth itself, avenging the spirits flying high through the dust that overhung the slopes of the ridges. And they made the soldiers pay a terrible price. Crazy horse leads another charge when the soldiers tried to rush off of that same ridge. But by the time, but soon enough, the fight is coming to a close. Occasional gunshots and then silence. After the second battle, one with a much more definitive bat ending, the Lakota have now defeated George Custer. So yeah, what did he do? let's go. They did it. But what did he do? <laughs> what he did was great. We think. No, we know. There's multiple accounts of people saying he was great. He was great. He may have led an attack to bring uh, soldiers back to Custer to kind of fight the, the last stand. They think that's what he did. Anyway, I wasn't frustrated at all. Despite the Battle of Little Bighorn being the biggest victory the Plains, in Plains tribe history, it has swift consequences. The Americans use Custer's last stand as an immediate rallying cry. Grant, before you wouldn't know this by his actions, was actually kind of hesitant to start an all-out war against the Sioux. But after Custer, Civil War hero Custer, hero of the Shenandoah Custer, he now has all the ammunition he needs. Even on the reservations they take away the guns from Red Cloud's agency. 
in part to stop any potential violence. But also keep in mind, these are the agency, Sue. Now, there were some that did sneak off to go to Little Bighorn, but most of them had nothing to do with it. So they're going to go and they're going to put a strict policy, no firearm policy on the reservation. Once a great warrior, Red Cloud is now mocked because, quote, it's because many warriors believe, quote, did they stand aside quietly like obedient children while the agent confiscated their guns and drove off their horses? Right. So he was getting mocked now that they he just let that happen. Right. When in reality, he probably did fight it. But what was he going to do at this point? <laughs> right. Like, what do, what do you want him to do? Regardless, uh, they end up taking them away, like I said, in part because of violence, but in part because they could still leave the reservation for like buffalo hunts. Uh, But if you don't have a gun to go hunting, really not great to go hunt buffalo. So there was a there was a double double method there. Crazy Horse's initial response when asked what he would do. Uh, what he was going to do in the aftermath, he would say, quote, fight to stay free and die a free Lakota. If it comes to that, I will never live on an agency, so I will never give up my horse or my gun. Debate spreads throughout the non-agency Lakota as they surrender. They know more troops are coming and they would be more motivated than ever to hunt down the Lakota. However, despite initial talks of dying a free Lakota, Crazy Horse is in charge of several families that are increasingly tired and weary of constant moving. Feeling a combination of what had to be a mixed feeling of anger, sadness, and responsibility, Crazy Horse agrees to meet to discuss surrender. And to give you an idea how fast all of this happens, Little Bighorn happens in June 1876. Crazy Horse is willing to discuss surrender in May of 1877. Less than a year. From feeling invincible to, hold on a minute, this is probably the end. Crazy Horse is given his terms of surrender and will be allowed to be on the Red Cloud Agency. He will be given food and protection in what has been so far a really hard winter of 1876-1877. In exchange, however, he must give up his guns, which he just called out Red Cloud for. Enraged, Crazy Horse, for one of the few times in his life, shows his anger and shoots his horse at the thought of giving up his weapons. So his horse is dead now. (laughs) Yep. That had to be a real split decision. (laughs) He then leaves as he had done so many times before battles just to go be by himself. However, this time he likely knew it was his last time as a free Lakota. He doesn't actually come onto the agency though, when he actually does give up the surrender. Instead, he chooses to live just outside the agency. They even said Red Cloud to come talk to Crazy Horse uh, with the promise of making him a chief on the Lakota agency. Regardless of everyone's opinions on Crazy Horse, all of their eyes are on him because they're not quite sure what he's going to do next. He may choose to flee and start to fight again. And to add some context, Sitting Bull is fleeing right now to Canada. And though we haven't talked about them yet, the Nez Perce had just broken away from their reservation and what is going to be an epic journey running away from the Americans also trying to get to Canada. All of this is happening at the same time. So pressure to bring sitting or crazy horse onto the reservation really grows. And it doesn't help that crazy horse himself is not much of a talker. (laughs) So rumors spread on what he's going to do. One rumor gets George Crook's attention because many believe Crazy Horse intends to kill Crook. So now a decision needs to be made on Crazy Horse. Initially, Crook sends out a party, including Red Cloud, to go talk to him. 
where he's asked to hand over his horse, which he peacefully does to everyone's surprise. He is surrendering and he agrees it to come into cram for, into Fort Robinson. But Crook just doesn't quite believe him. So instead of allowing Crazy Horse to surrender, Crook orders his arrest and he sends out 60 men to do so. Let me go back just a little bit. And we're going to read his dream. Just at the end. Near the end of the quote. The horse was strong and swift as it changed colors. Red, yellow, black, white, and blue. Bullets and arrows suddenly filled the air. Flying at the horse and the rider as they passed throughout without without touching him. Above him all was a red-tailed hawk, sending out its shield try. People, his own kind, suddenly rose up all around him and grabbed the rider, pulling him down from behind. End quote. With that context in mind, most of the 60 men Crook sends out are natives. At the end of that quote, it was he was pulled down by his own people. On September 5th, 1877, Crazy Horse is now being pushed towards the jail by those 60 men. He begins to fight, but is trying to be, but the men are trying to subdue him. When a man named Little Big Man wrapped his arms around Crazy Horse and Crazy Horse is yelling, let me go, let me go. Crazy Horse is able to reach for a knife and cuts the arm of Little Big Man. He then leaves the jail with a few steps when more men grab him from each side. In the middle of the confusion, a soldier equipped with a bayonet stabs Crazy Horse. Where he says, let me go, you have gotten me hurt. And everyone can tell that the wound is mortal. Crazy Horse, even when he is dying, and this is a nice little tip, he refused to lie on a cot because he refused to be made on anything made by a white man. <laughs> Instead, he insists on being placed on the floor. The American soldier stood by until he died, which is a short time longer, with his final words being, quote, tell the people they should no longer depend on me any longer. Dang. It's that quick. Less than a year of after Little Bighorn, he's not only surrendering, but he's killed by his own people. So it sounds like um, that was the catalyst for the end. Yep. It's a lot of people look at Little Bighorn as the closing of the planes because that's when the Americans were really just took it seriously. They're like, all right, it's time to stop messing around. Let's go. Let's get in, get out. Right. Call it a day. Yes. But now we need to rank him. All right. First round. Are you satisfied? This is our biography round where we'll be handing out negative 10 points apiece to positive 10 points apiece, depending on how well he liked his story. Matt? Um, I liked his story. I thought it was interesting. I mean, he had some cool stuff. Um, it's interesting that he kind of led, I don't know if it would be normal, but you know, a lot of raids before all this craziness happened. Um, it's funny that he had like his one defining moment too, you know, um, after a dream, it's so interesting when those dreams, like I see it a lot in, um, like native American, um, history. Um, even when we were doing like Tecumseh and Tenskatawa, like they both had like dreams and visions that like interpreted into reality you know right i thought the last uh, it's unfortunate that um we kind of saw it with red cloud too once the americans came in it kind of their life kind of fizzled out i guess they had to stop doing what they did you know um but overall like he Seemed like a minus his one scandal. scandal. 
every 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 uh historical figure gets one i guess right um that's a pretty crazy scandal though i mean that's it seems a little risque um well consider that's so out of his granted we don't get much of his personality and in fact i don't think he had much of a personality because he just seemed like very stoic very quiet very don't talk to me ever type vibe and then to be caught with a married woman yes that is such a out of left field story and it's it's just so funny too because like every time like he would go to a battle or something bad would happen like he'd go off on his own and just need like time to think like he was this like very like you said stoic like i need time to think and then all of a sudden it's just like um crazy horse you in there yelp <laughs> sure <Yeah>. am <laughs> like what that's crazy but overall i liked it um i liked his story quite a bit i'm gonna do uh, a solid uh seven seven I think where he gets hurt, it's just, there's not, I want to know what he did during the battle of little bighorn. That would be great. That would add a few points. That's just another one of those things of, I mean, no Americans were left alive. Right. So no one could tell the tale of what happened, but they saw him do it. I just want, no, they saw him do something great. They don't know what they saw. (laughs) Just a little detail, guys. I appreciate you you being a witness, but something. Yeah, I just we're I'm gonna go a little bit lower than that. I like the story, but I I feel like there could have been so much more. Cause like you get the feeling, oh, he's leading two hundred families. And the only reason we know that is because somebody told us he led two hundred families. And like I there's so much context we don't know because it's oral tradition and those just didn't translate across so right. it's hard it's hard to say like how much influence and charisma he really had other than just saying it he led right. by example i love the thought of him just chipping off the ice of his horse's hoof because he's bored waiting for them to attack i love the making a fire uh for the during the same battle yeah overall i, I mean i liked it i'm not gonna go as high as seven um because the sources aren't aren't all there i'm gonna go five okay which is an overall score of 12 i might regret that five we'll find out next round be sure you are right and then go ahead this is our morality round where we're gonna be handing out negative 10 points apiece to positive 10 points apiece depending on how well he was morally I I think he was. I mean, minus the stepping out. I mean, he didn't really have he didn't really have too many like he didn't do anything that would be seen as crazily like out of bounds, right? He he was given a shirt. He was chosen to be a shirt wear a shirt wearer for a for a reason. Um so I'm gonna do like a I think I'm gonna stick with my seven. I think he was a great war leader. Mm -hmm. And I mean, obviously he was affected by the atrocities that befolded on him, befallen on him. Befallen. Befallen. Befolded on him. I don't know. Um, It's not like he was a careless, I'm going to go and just kill whoever, whenever, wherever. It's very reactionary. I think right. that's, I think that's fair. I what I didn't talk about a lot is obviously they go on a lot of raids, but he also went on a lot of hunting and he would bring back a lot of um like food just for the tribe in general. So I didn't really go into that cuz there's not much to go into other than he did that. Uh um, So he wanted he obviously wanted to take care of his people. Right. So, I think I think seven's fine. I think that's a good score. I'm just going to match that. But honestly, there's there's not a whole lot to really discuss on this re- in this round. To hell with the consequences. Uh, that, sorry, his total score for Be Sure or Right is 14. To hell with the consequences. This is our crazy or clever round. We're going to be handing out negative 10 points apiece if we think he's more on the crazy side to positive 10 points apiece, depending on if we think he's clever. Um, I, I'm going to do like a five because I don't think he was 
uh, that uh, like the points I'm giving him for are, you know, the um, where he did, you know, uh, chip off the old ice and create a fire like mm-hmm. they were really, uh, really trying to get him to come on, come on out. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think he was like extremely, you know, clever or even cr- I don't think he was crazy at all. But um, which is ironic considering his name is Crazy Horse. <laughs> but um so yeah that's where it kind of where i'm sitting yeah he wasn't he wasn't crazy like uh, um again this is where we would like more details on how clever he was but um i'm gonna go a little bit lower than that i'm just gonna go with a four uh to be a little bit different than you so <laughs> well it's just you're right. Like I, I, I've kind of been your boat too. I wish there was a lot more stuff. Like I mean, who knows? What if he created like this crazy, um, big plan, uh, to kill? What if he uh was the one that killed Custer? You know, we'll never know because we just know that he did something great, right? And that's it. He did. He did something great, and that's what's all. He may have planned everything, but yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, there's just not a lot here to talk about either he wasn't dumb by any means so by result he, he did he did sleep with that guy's wife he did <laughs> and then he got shot in the jaw which is a real bummer hey man you, you do the crime you do the time yeah well he got three horses everything's fine and the girl oh but that he didn't even nope, marry he didn't even marry her. <laughs> <laughs> which to be fair he married the girl that helped tend to him <laughs> yes well, to me, if I get sh- if I got shot in the jaw, I would probably think twice about uh, marrying that person. Person. All I can uh, say is, hey, if that's not proof of everything happens for a reason, then yeah. hey, I don't know what is. Yeah, I'm sure that's exactly what he thought. Is he was pulling the ball <laughs> out of his mouth, <laughs> spitting it out. <laughs> oh man, shouldn't have been with this man's wife. All right, total score of nine. So. His score right now is an overall of 35, positive 35. So from here on out, we're only going to be continuing to add to a score. If he had been at negative 35, we would continue to subtract from a score. So our next round is draw. How screwed are we if we would go into a duel with Crazy Horse? I think we'd be screwed. What do you think? I don't know how to read this one because if we wronged him, we're quite screwed. We would be screwed greatly and we probably wouldn't know how we would be killed. Maybe like a three then. Yeah, I don't have. Yeah, you're right. He's another one of these figures where it's like, unless you wrong them, they're not just going to come at you. Right. Unless, unless you happen to be, maybe we need to view these, uh, the tribes, the, the native Americans as, if we were in a a neighboring tribe, because if that's the case, then we're worried. Yeah, we're screwed. Crazy. Yeah, then that's like a six, seven. I think that's our strategy. I think because like uh, he's not someone I would want to face in a fight. So I guess we yeah, we do need to view it as if we got into a fight with him, especially yeah. especially with him being able to, you know, like round up the troops. So I'm going to say seven, seven. Seven's a good score. You really like seven on this one. I do. I do. <laughs> um, yeah, he went on a lot of raids. He re- it really sounds like he could handle himself. He really so, yeah. did, didn't he? <laughs> years and years of raiding. And, and he always came back. Them. He did. There, it's, it's a lot of raids. A ridiculous amount of raids. Anyway, uh, total score of four. I did seven also, if I didn't say that. So another score of 14 next round legacy how well known is he going from zero to ten well i mean they're building a monument in south dakota after him uh yes a lot of that has stalled because i don't believe the tribe is accepting federal funds for they only do donations correct yes i think that's what it is um it is it is actually a pretty uh cool monument um but massive 
it, oh, it's going to be so like big. 100 feet high. Like it's I think they've be been working on it for years and what? They only have like the head? Last time I was there, it was like kind of like a head only. Yeah. As far as I know, that's all they have right now. But it's it's going to make Mount Rushmore look tiny. And Mount Rushmore already is tiny. So, I mean, as far as the sculpture goes, it's quite large. But yes, it's not. It's not. It's, <laughs> It's not what you see on TV. Anyways, um, I'm going to do, <laughs> um, I'm going to oh, do just like angry eight. Someone. eight. Hmm. I think he's really well known. I think all three of these figures that we're going to do for this are, are very, very well known. Yes, I think. I know I bring him up a lot. But when you compare him to to Kamsa. Um, Crazy Horse is a clear step above, like as far as fame oh, yeah. goes. Oh yeah, uh, from way Kamsa. way better, or not way better, but way more well known. Is he more well known than Red Cloud? I think so. What did we give Red Cloud? I think I gave him like a six or something, didn't I? You gave him a four. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was gonna say I didn't. I didn't. I had never heard of Red Cloud before that. I gave him a seven, so I I think by that logic, I was going to go seven and a half, seven or so, but I think by the, he is more famous than Red Cloud, so I think eight is a perfectly acceptable score. We're matching a lot on this one. I don't know if I like that. Uh, <laughs> total score is 16 for Legacy. Next round, death bonus. We're going to give him up to two bonus points if we think he had a cool story for a death. And it's just more depressing than cool, but it is, it was, it was, prem- it was, uh, oh, it was, if it was, yep, he did. So I'm going to do one for that. Otherwise I was about to say zero, but I forgot that it was like someone had the, yeah, it was a, a prophetic vision that he had. Yeah. I can argue with that. I'm going to go 0. 0.5, uh, just cause he did vision it. Cause I was going to go zero too, cause it's more depressing than it is anything. And it's, it should have never even happened. No, it would just, it seemed like it just, it seems like it literally comes out of nowhere where they go from such a high, high to less than a year later, he's surrendering. And like six months after that, he's dead. Like it is such, such a very sharp decline. It almost seems like it comes out of nowhere. So I'm going to go 0.5, which gives him a total score of 1.5 for his death bonus. Next round, counting coup. This is our confirmed-ish kills. We're going to take that number and divide it by 10. And I'll be honest with you, I cannot find this number. I don't know how many. Typically, you can find, uh, you can typically find, like, how many battle honors they have. He really doesn't have it. But he went on a lot of raids. So do we just treat him like a general and give him the 10? Yeah, yeah. I just, he really gets hurt by lack of sourcing. <laughs> I mean, saying you're awesome, it does not help us out at all. <laughs> well, others saying that he's awesome doesn't really right. help us at all because that's all that they say. Yeah, he was great. He was wonderful. And then that's any detail? No? Okay. Anything? Okay. Fine. So that gives him uh, one point for counting coup. And let's be honest, that number should be much higher. I just don't know how else to look at how to find that. So that brings his total score to a very respectable 67.5. Not bad. No, it's pretty good. I want to. I want to zoom out just a little bit because I want to see how he does compared to Red Cloud. Red Cloud scored 61.6. Tenskwatawa was negative 12.5. And Tecumseh has 70. So my boy, my boy is still, still above. <laughs> still oh, top dog for now. <laughs> I will make that score set. Okay. Now I have. All right. So next up is the drafting so eric and i are creating two teams each with 20 figures um he is going to be grabbing a coin i'm going to be calling it in the air if i'm right i get to pick if i want to add them to my team or not eric will get it if i get it wrong um 
the rest of the figures after the 20 our teams are filled up we'll go into the free agent pool that we can add and drop whoever we want and at the end have a big bracket style tournament to see who is the number one figure so eric go ahead whenever you're ready so i will say i am two persons behind if i lose this coin flip i want i don't want to flip the coin next episode if i lose this that'd be three down right. yep. all right yep we agree i think we originally agreed on two so this coin flip even right Was now it? is shoddy did I we agree to <laughs> i don't know that was you just I, know. <laughs> I just know i want to make a fuss about it heads it is oh that's tails that is tails too much why i said heads oh you're right i get him good <laughs> i was like did you not want him or no, i don't I understand Sorry. i got excited good and actually i was if you did win that one i was going to make like so if if I if you would have won that toy toss, I would have said something to the tune of like, "If you take Crazy Horse, you are gifting me Sitting Bull, right? Because he is next." So up. now you're only one behind, though. I am only one behind, so we got to flip the coin. So that brings Sitting Bull back into your, into your, uh, into my pool. You're able to get potential. It, it is yeah. potentially there. I hope you don't, but because honestly they don't want to be on your team i mean you, you see who's on your team I, i'm so i'm a villain i mean we're i'm the villain team people. right now <laughs> yeah we're a bunch of hooligans yeah you are shysters even there's your word all right i think with that uh that's all i have on crazy horse so remember to go ahead and leave a like and comment for us on the subscription service you are using to listen um that would help us out tremendously also you can check out our website ranking76.wordpress.com where you can access our reddit facebook email instagram you can look at our current teams and the rankings up until this point um we appreciate you listening and thank you very much and as always I'm Matt. And I'm Eric. And we will see you later.